study with prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray that you will help us by your Holy Spirit as we study to understand and to gain what we should from this study this evening. In your name we pray, amen. Now, I'm, I'm using my phone tonight. I hope that doesn't offend anyone, but what that allows me to do is I can, I can do parallel on my phone and I can choose which version I parallel. So uh, this, this really is, I'm trying to do and I don't know that I explained it well last week, but go a few verses at a time and talk about them, and some of them are going to catch our attention more than others, just because you can have one verse in the midst of many that, that might need that commentary more than others, um, or you might have a group of verses together that are really transparent, not difficult to understand and sometimes explain each other. So, I'm not actually, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not going verse by verse, and I'm not trying to be uh, maybe super in-depth because we're taking it in, in little chunks on a Sunday night. But I do want us to gain some things and some understanding of what the apostle was saying in this letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. Part of the reason is because there are some things, there are some subjects in 1 Corinthians that are a little bit difficult, and we will address them, and we will study them, and, uh, and we are going through, and we're, we're going to find some things here, uh, but we're going to begin with one, and let me read to you the first five verses. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For, as, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? And, and that... Division is something we talked about last week. Some saying, well, you know, I was saved under Paul, and others saying I was saved under Apollos, and even some saying I was saved under Peter, and some were super spiritual and said, Jesus saved me, okay? But, which actually that's not inaccurate, but it was just kind of combative maybe. Uh, so that was, that's what he's talking about here. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed even as the Lord gave to every man. So let's talk for a minute because it's not my words, it's what we just read, that the Corinthians' state was carnal. Now, this, this is fun. I, I, etymology, um, I got a lesson, I've had a lesson in etymology talking just things like this through with, with Hector because he'll be speaking in English and, and try to say the flesh, and he'll say carne, and he'll go, the meat, <laughs> and we laugh about it. But actually, when that word does mean the flesh, and so what the apostle is telling them is that they are still in the flesh, and and. Verse 2 said, I have fed you with milk and not meat, for other two were you not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, because, verse 3, ye are yet carnal. And, and there's, he gives evidence of the carnal state of, of their spiritual lives. Because he says, because there is among you envying and strife and divisions. And he says, and since those things are so, it's pretty obvious, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and that's, that's, that's the Aaron parallel, um, is it not obvious that you are carnal, you are still living after the flesh, you haven't received the full measure that you can have of the Spirit? Now, does anybody have a comment on that? Mm -hmm. 
If you were to look in the Amplified like I am, verse 3 says this, you are still worldly, and there's a footnote that literally, it literally means fleshly, okay? So, so this is what it says, you are yet worldly, <clears throat> and then in brackets it says, controlled by ordinary impulses, the sinful capacity. For as long as there's jealousy and strife and discord among you, are you not unspiritual, and you are, are you not walking like ordinary men, and then this is in brackets, okay? unchanged by faith there it is so how is it this is a question for you because we studied in in chapter one last week um in in when paul first opened up this epistle with his greeting this is what he said verse two of chapter one Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So how is it that they are among those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, and yet he is saying unto them, you are yet worldly, you are yet fleshly, you are yet unchanged by faith? How, how can that be? Jim, were you going to help me? Oh, Okay. I thought you had a, good, a great comment. Right. So how do we harmonize what we just read in, in, in chapter 1, verse 2, and then what we just read in, in the first three verses of chapter 3? And, and I'm, I'm going to help you. <laughs> uh, the apostle, when he is giving his greeting to the church, is talking to the church. And as he speaks to the church, they are, in a sense, sanctified because they are set apart for God's work. Now, at this point, God's work within them is dealing with babes in Christ and, and worldly, fleshly, carnal church members. And yet, God had begun, and, and it's very clear, you, as we read on, you'll see this, God had begun a work within them that he intended to complete, because that's what God does. You see, this wasn't, I remember when, uh, I'll, let's just imagine with me, uh, if you can, I was a teenager once upon a time, and, and to make it even harder, I was skinny then, and but there was among some other young men, and uh, we were talking about some churches, and, and this one guy said, talking about another church, he said, and now, same denomination, right? We're, we're not talking about a church uh, that was in, you know, a, another world. It was, it was our denomination. And he said, well, that church is kind of raunchy, isn't it? <laughs> we're, we're not talking, Paul wasn't writing to them to tell them, how bad off they were and they needed to be completely cut off. He actually is telling them, you are part of the church of God, sanctified. Now, so, so that's one part of it. But another part of it is that when these, these were saved people, their lives were being changed and had been changed, and God's initial sanctification was at work in their lives. He was, you see, when God, when somebody comes to God and, and lays out their sin and, and lays themselves at the foot of the cross and, uh, and says to God, I am trusting fully in you to change me, to save me, and to turn my life around from sin and destruction to life and life everlasting. They're saved. At that moment, and we've read this, I'm not going to read it again tonight, but we've read it, that, that it is God's, it's been God's plan from the beginning that those people would be, who are entered into his kingdom in that fashion, his plan is for them to be conformed to the image of Christ. 
And he begins that work immediately. And so he begins the work of sanctification when a person is justified, born again, made right with God. Now, that's not the end of it, okay? But at this point, this church of God is set apart for God himself to work his will, which is, and, and I, I said initial sanctification, but his I, I, initial sanctification is, involves a progressive walk to the point where God is able to entirely sanctify and conform people to his image. But at this point, these people needed to have their spirit and their motivation addressed. And so Paul is telling them that they are carnal, they are of the flesh, and you could see that by the way that they walked. Okay? Let's move on. And, and by the way, I don't think... Maybe I did read verse 5, but I, I, I don't think I did. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? And that matters at this point because um, the controversy still is that there are people who are saying, I was converted under Paul, I was converted under Apollos, I was converted under Peter. And, and there, it's causing divisions among them. And so Paul is telling them, you're, you're carnal, you're babes in Christ, I'm dealing with you in this fashion, and so who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, and, and God sent the ministers, but it wasn't in the ministers in which they believed, it was God himself in whom they believed. And so he goes on to say, um, and, and God's agency, and, and he's, I want us to grab something as we go through these next few verses where he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth, he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. All right? This is God's work. There's nobody who's great or small in it. Because it's not my work, it's not your work, it wasn't Peter's work, it wasn't Paul's work. Whose work was it? God's work. And we are, in, in this picture, we are laborers together with God. It's not God who's laboring together with us. We have joined our efforts with God's plan and his purpose. And, and whenever, whenever you look at it that way, we should be giving all of ourselves to God's work and to what he has to say to us. And, and, and just, it, But at the same time, we're fully understanding that it's because it's God's plan and he called me to his work and I'm going to give the best of my efforts, but my efforts throughout... In, in the whole picture of history, are very, very feeble. And God's in control through the whole thing. So it, it, it's from that kind of motivation that Paul could say, we are laborers together with God. He also says, you're God's husbandry. I'm, I'm, I, I was thinking about this. I'm going to be careful what I say here, though. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but the word husband, we, we think about husband, right? Husband and wife. But then when it says you're God's husbandry, it's talking about what? That's right. So husbandry has to do with gardening or farming, really. Um, and, we, and we hear that word used that way a lot. It's not an ancient thing. Um, it, it can have to do, a lot of times, husbandry, we think of that as uh, being in a vineyard where, where people are growing grapes. Um, but it's also used when, when you're talking about somebody who raises cows and, or, or has a farm. 
So, what is husbandry in, in that sense? It's cultivating for the purpose of growth. Okay? So, he's saying here, you are God's husbandry. He, it is God's great purpose to cultivate something here in Corinth and within each one of you for the purpose of growth. Now, let's just apply that since we're here real quickly to the home, husbands. If, if you're a husband, your purpose is to cultivate a, a, your, the life around your wife to help her to be everything that she can be. Now, we could start making jokes about that very quickly, I'm afraid, but anyhow. <laughs> it, it, it is a husband's, it should be a husband's purpose to help his wife to not just, okay, not just about taking care of the kids, but to be a partner who develops in so many ways so that she develops into a person that she can be and should be. All right, so, but we're going to move on past that now, okay? You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. Two different ways of looking at the same thing. God, as, a, as involved in husbandry, to cultivate within us and within the church that which would bring us into being sanctified saints of God. But we're also God's building. He is making us to be, building us up to be what he wants us to be. In a little bit, we're going to see where the Apostle Paul talks about us being temples. Okay? Your body's your temple. But we're not there yet. And yet we're talking about being God's building. Okay? Let's uh, go on down to verse 11 because this is an important text. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is that than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's one foundation of the church, and it's not men, it's not doctrine, it's not a given group of churches, it's not even, a, let's say, a certain era in church history. There is one foundation upon which the church should be built, and this is a test, by the way. If, if you're hearing, if somebody's talking to you about something and they say, well, this is really what the Bible means or this is what uh, God's people should be or it should always be laid on the foundation of Jesus Christ, his divinity, his crucifixion, his blood, his sacrifice. I preached from this passage where we're heading and among some people, it's still famous because it says this in verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And I had pictures of cars and houses, and I set them on fire right up here, and some people, I think, thought I was going to burn the church down. But the church stood the test of fire, or at least I did, and it didn't burn. Um, and and <laughs> it's, a, it's a memorable, I thought about doing it tonight, but then I decided I shouldn't like try it twice and push my luck. <laughs> um, but it's memorable because the idea here is that even as Christians, we have choices to make. And the choices that we make are the works that are going to follow us and they're going to be tried. And so, so God gives us, he, he gives us, when we begin our life, right, he gives us, and we don't know, but there's a certain amount of time, there's a certain amount of energy, and we get to handle how it works. And in the end, when we're done, and we don't know we're done until we're done, but when we're done, there's going to be a testing. And if we've given that energy, even if we've given our lives to Jesus, and, and I, I think I'm within Scripture saying this right here, uh, even if we've given our lives to Jesus, we can make choices that are more shallow. And 
those works are going to be tried, and if they were made on a basis of worldliness, okay, that flesh motivation, the, the carnal Christian kind of decisions, they'll be burnt by fire. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean every, we're gonna, everything's going to burn down? Well, eventually, yes. But we, we are all headed for the grave. Let's, let's be real. All right? What, whatever age we may be, that's where we all, it's all going to end unless we are caught up in the rapture. But if we die, if I were to die today, the things that I may have acquired or thought that I needed, they'll rust or they'll rot and they'll fade away. Things will fade away. But if I have furthered God's kingdom by being faithful to people's souls, that's eternal work and it will last forever. I just... The part of the reason I'm I'm going through First Corinthians is I'm studying it online, one of my classes, and the question came up about this uh, this verse fifteen. If any man's work, um, well, let, let me back up to fourteen. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And it's on those words that I base the idea that we have decisions to make, even as Christians, and some of them aren't going to stand up. And I go to Second Peter chapter 2. Verses 6 through 8. When Peter was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, he said this, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And listen, and delivered just Lot, okay? So he's, he's saying here that not only was Lot delivered, but he was a man who was just before God. And he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, that's still talking about Lot, calling him a righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And yet, when this righteous soul of this righteous man, this just man, was running away from Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah was burning down, he brought two daughters with him. Everything else burnt except his wife was turned to a pillar of salt. But she was gone. And and all there were were these two daughters who led him into sinfulness. So we have here a picture of a man who And his heart was just and righteous before God, and yet his deeds didn't stand up. Well, let's let's move on. Sorry, I almost started talking from Second Peter. That didn't make sense. Go down to verse sixteen in First Corinthians chapter three. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now that sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? Like, okay, you're the temple of God, and if you defile your temple, God's going to destroy you. Well, this was a principle that Paul was applying. So, so in verse 17, when he says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. He's actually talking about the building. But then he jumps back and says, And you, like that building, are a temple. So there's a very strong principle that applied to that physical temple, and, and yet he's comparing us to that temple, okay? 
Uh, verse 18, the wisdom of this world versus God's wisdom. Let no man de deceive himself. If any uh, man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He hath taken the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in man. Um, and, and I'm reading on down through here. For all things are yours. And that's, that's the Apostle Paul talking to the church. Whether Paul or Apollos, now he's talking about that again, or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you're Christ and Christ is God's. And, and in a nutshell, what we just read there is um, some of these people were kind of enamored with the wisdom of the world still from whence they'd come, whence they'd come. But what the apostle was saying is God's wisdom is much higher than the wisdom of the world. The world can't understand God's wisdom, but God's wisdom is available. But God's wisdom is available to the humble. So in this humble walk, all things are yours because you belong to Jesus Christ, and as you are his, he is God's. All right, now into chapter 4. We just finished with those words then, right? That this wisdom is available to you and, and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, okay? Now, now Paul has addressed that to them and then he comes back to himself and says, just as you are, so am I, except more so. Because I am a steward of the mysteries of God. This, this language of stewardship is something that we've talked about before. I know some of us might not know it or remember it, but it's, it's talking about a person who was made an overseer of um, a vineyard or a piece of property. So there's a master, he owns, let's, let's talk about a vineyard. He owns a vineyard, master owns a vineyard, but he has more than one vineyard and, and this is a minor piece of his wealth. And so he'll bring in a man who he trusts and put him in charge of this vineyard, it's not the steward's vineyard, right? It's the master's vineyard. But the steward is to treat it, in a sense, as if it were his, but in, on the other hand, it's not his. So he doesn't have the power to sell it. He doesn't have the power to run it as he wishes. He is, as a steward, answering to the master for the way that he handles that which has been placed in, into his care. So, also, the Apostle Paul is saying these things that are being revealed, the mysteries that are being revealed through me, I must handle them carefully because they are from God. And so, he goes on to say, moreover, it is required in stewards. He's talking about himself, but now he's going to turn it around and, and he, he's, he's got a point to make here. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So if he's saying... And, and he's, um, just a few verses back in, in the end of chapter 3, he was talking about Paul, Apollos, Peter, and, and you could lump in there any other preacher that might have been preaching to them that was anointed of God, are a steward of the mysteries of God or those things that God chooses to reveal. And it's required in those stewards that a man be found faithful. It is absolutely imperative that a man be found faithful as he handles the Word of God. And so he goes on to say, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. I don't even judge myself. And, and he goes on to talk about, like, I know nothing. I, I, the only thing that is required of me isn't that... Um, I be justified, but that when God judges me, I have been found faithful. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the heart. And then every man have praise of men? No, of God. Okay, so this is once again the idea that 
we have a tendency to look at other people and go, man, they have it good. But the end of the story is not yet written. And we don't know how it's going to turn out. But we do know this, that when we stand before God, we're going to answer for that uh, of which we've been made a steward. <clears throat> if you read verses 10 through 18, and maybe we can skip over a few things, but it begins in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake. Now he's lumping several, he's lumping the apostleship together. And he's saying, we are fools for Christ's sake, but we are, but ye are wise in Christ. Even unto this present hour, verse 11, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted. And verse 12, and labor and working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, in verse 13, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. By the way, that in, in the in a lot of other versions um, that, that where it says offscouring, it says we are the scum of the earth. And I know that people take that to mean that as Christians we are the scum of the earth and there's even a church that's the scum of the earth church out of context, <laughs> okay? Because this is the Apostle Paul telling the church at Corinth, us who have labored among you as preachers and teachers. This is the life we live. He's not complaining. He's just saying, don't judge us by the money that we have because this is the life we've lived. And it goes on um, down into verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So, now Paul brings it back in and he says, however, we've all suffered all of these things. Many people have preached to you, but I am the father of this church and the gospel. And he's saying that not for his own uh, praise or his own advancement, but what he is saying is, I'm about to say something to you. And this is the authority by which I do it. It's not the authority that I am great. It's not the authority that I have been... Uh, honored and treated like royalty. It's simply by the fact that I have given my life to further the gospel. And I came to Corinth in, when I was feeling very, very low. And I came to Corinth, a town, a city that was full of sinfulness. And yet God saw fit to, to use me and others to establish a church in that wicked city, in that wealthy city, in that beautiful city, but a city that was far, far from God. He established a church that is yet carnal, but God has plans for it. <clears throat> Verse 18, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. And, and simply saying, uh, verse 19, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. There were simply people who were saying, you know what? The Apostle Paul wrote us a letter or is writing us letters and what, what's he doing? We're still in charge. We're untouched. What's a letter going to do to us? But he's saying, if it's God's will, I'll come to you and I will test the spirit of those who are saying, I am, and, and, and this is what <clears throat> the Amplified says in verse 19 about, it says, but the power. Um, he says, but I will come to you soon if the Lord is willing, and I will find out not just the talk of these arrogant people, but evaluate their spiritual power, whether they live up to their own claims. And then on into verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power, <clears throat> applying it to that. In, in fact, I like, <laughs> I like what the Amplified says there too. For the kingdom of God is not based on talk, but on power. Remember that. Which do you prefer? Now, he said that. The, the kingdom, some of you are puffed up and you're talking big. This is Aaron's translation again. But I'm going to come if the Lord wills. And we'll see. 
Because the kingdom of God isn't about talk. It's about the power of God. And then he says, which do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline and correction or with love and a gentle spirit? He's actually asking them, if all of these things are so, how should I come to you? You want me to come with a rod of discipline and correction? Or do you want me to come with love and a gentle spirit? And when we go into chapter 5, you're going to see he asks this question, and then he moves right into the big problem. And, and the answer to this question really depends on how they deal with the problem. He says, do you want me to come with, you a, rod, with a rod of correction and discipline? Or do you want me to come in love and a gentle spirit? And then he says, here's the problem. You have someone among you who's involved in sin that ought not to be so. How are you going to deal with it? But I'm not going into chapter 5 tonight. <laughs> we will talk more about that next week, Lord willing. All right. So we'll finish with prayer. Um, are there any requests? So, those of you who don't know who Mike Yancey is, which I think there's probably three. <laughs> Do you know Mike? Yeah. Um, he, he was the pastor here before I was. There was a gap between us, but he, but he was the pastor right before. So, he is uh, in Ohio. He's younger than I am. Not that that means a lot, but... Um, let's pray for him. He's in this crisis with an unhealthy. Anyone else? All right, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you one more time for the things that we can learn in your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the enlightenment of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us this evening as we looked into the Word of God. We pray for our friend Mike. We pray that you'll be close to him, be close to Regina, but especially give Mike a physical touch according to your will. We hold him up before you, the work that he is doing at God's Bible School. And Lord, we pray that you will just um, give him a healing touch this evening, whatever the doctors would do, may it be what needs to be done. Lord, we pray that you'll be with his kids, his family. We pray that you'll just help them. Lord, we also pray for Edith tonight. We, um, we pray that you'll help her to heal as she's working through this knee replacement surgery. Lord, we pray that you will be with uh, th those who are sick, the ones we mentioned this morning. We think of the Durkies, and we pray that you'll help them and continue to give a touch there we pray for tom be close to him and give him a touch we pray for those who um, weren't here this morning and lord we pray especially that you'll be with uh, randy and Kristen and help them and be with uh, each one who has a different kind of need among us we hold them up before you the ones we may not mention and yet lord we think of them now or may think of them later lord we pray that uh you'll continue to give joyce a touch and help her be with the kids downstairs lord we pray that your will be done in the in the spanish services you know the needs that are there and we pray that you'll uh, provide according to your plan lord we believe that you can and that you will be with us throughout this week be with dr avery as he comes 
We pray that you'll help him to deliver to us that which we need to hear. We pray that you'll be with him next week and uh, as he preaches to us. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us in the days ahead, the things that we have planned, um, the ministerial, the travels, the IHC, the local IHC, all of those things. Lord, we pray that you'll help us each one and then be with Eric and Callie and their new charge that they will have success not for for not according to the world standards but according to the standard that you have and that we read about tonight. Lord, we pray that you'll just go with us as we leave this place, touch each one, bring us together again according to your plan and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.